Some of these are questions uh, that are submitted from you, and we are anxious to get into these. And the first one is, in this postmodern world, what argument, what argument can you make for the assertion that truth matters? Why should I live my life according to the truth? We begin with the coherence of the truth claims of Christianity that we cannot actually consistently live our lives without the truth of the gospel. And so one of the things that we do when we talk to unbelievers is we show them how they cannot truly live without Christ. And so we expose inconsistencies in their lives. Uh, Francis Schaeffer used to talk about doing pre-evangelism. Sometimes in love, you have to remove the roof over somebody's head and allow the avalanche of their inconsistencies to fall upon them so they see their need of Christ. And so as Christians, we believe that everything coheres in Christ and the gospel, and that only the Christian worldview provides a coherent view of the, of the true, the good, and the beautiful. So really believe and affirm the coherence of the Christianity. You know, I mentioned this earlier in the talk. This, it's fascinating, this new expression, my truth, your truth. Um, I remember hearing the, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida sort of associated with deconstructionism. And I remember someone saying, you know, Derrida's idea is that texts mean whatever you want them to mean. There's no meaning in a text, there's just interpretations. And texts are also ways of talking about reality for him. A text is a metaphor for reality. So there's an, a true reality, there's just realities, whatever you want to make it. But when Derrida takes his paycheck, took, he's passed now, but when he took his paycheck to the bank to deposit into his account, he probably would not have liked it had the teller said, well, my interpretation of your paycheck is this. Right? To, to say that there is my truth and your truth bumps us into reality. Uh, you know, my truth can be that I can fly, uh, but I can't, all right? So there is something to that about the truth. All right, number two. When talking to people about the purpose of life, some people have said life has no purpose. Others have said the meaning of life, just like truth is what you make it, the meaning of life is what you make of it. How would you respond? Life has no purpose. I think the I think moment, the moment you that you say life, life has no purpose is the moment, is the moment that you affirm you're actually living for some purpose. Because, because, because even to make that statement, you're affirming a whole bunch of different stuff that is kind of subterranean and under the surface, <laughs> under the surface uh, in, in, the uh, in, in the way you're thinking. And, and that's, and, and that's real popular, popular today because we've been taught, we've been taught that we are nothing but a collocation of collection of atoms and molecules that come from nothing but matter and energy. And if that's what, and you, if that's what you believe about, about reality, it's a pretty it's hopeless, bleak, awful, meaningless place. And so what we find now is kind of passing attempts to find some meaning, maybe through art or music, or music awesome, things, awesome things, wonderful things, or, or making a name for ourselves. And, and, the whole and, and the whole thing, I would say that I'm going to challenge is an underlying assumption that all we, are, all we are is matter and energy. People are, people are different than rocks. <laughs> I mean I, know that, I mean, I know that sounds like it's crazy to, 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 to say that, but just, but recognize, just recognize that one of the top ethical advisors, advisors kind of just kind of misnomer, misnomer for this in our, in our country is a guy, is a guy named Peter, Peter Singer from Princeton, Princeton University. Who said this? Who said this? He teaches, he teaches ethics at probably the nation's, the nation's highest ranked university. university. Yeah, he's, he's, ethics is a study of how to live, what is right and wrong. He said this. He said this. A cat is a rat, is a dog, is a pig, is a boy. Do you see what he's saying? There is, there is, no, there is no difference, difference between you and a rat. He, he's gone, he, he's gone, gone to argue for um, post-delivery post abortion up to 18 months. But they translate, but they translate that, you can kill a kid 18 months after they've been born. And people are, and people are taking him seriously. And so here's, and so here's the thing. His whole, his whole world view was we are matter and energy. So we're meaningless. So we're meaningless. <laughs> and, the solution, and the solution to that is a worldview. Is a worldview. That the, gospel, that the gospel gives us that things like things like art and, and beauty music and music, love and love and truth and matter because we are because we are more than that. We're made in the 
or made in the image of God who made matter. And we matter. We matter as a call. He made us to be that way. Thank you. Thank you. How would you answer a Muslim who does not take scripture references as accurate? Instead, they uphold the Quran. Um, one thing it's important to do is, is to actually ask a person to give you specific examples of what they are alleging to be or inconsistencies. Uh, I think that's important. So you're actually responding to real criticisms. Uh, it's part of what Dr. Nichols was saying to treat people you know, with reverence and, and respond to them with gentleness. So in apologetics, you have to listen to those who are criticizing you. And then understand, uh, we can talk about external evidences about the Bible, and so we can look at historical verification or eyewitnesses that validate the truth claims of the Bible, both in the ancient Near East and Greco-Roman worlds, in the Old Testament and New Testament. We can also talk about internal evidences that validate the truth claims of the Bible. That is, you can look at how all the Bible presents a single message that centers on Jesus. And so you have promises and fulfillments of those promises in Christ, so the internal evidence. But understand, you're dealing with a spiritual book, ultimately. And it requires a, a spiritual work to fully understand the truth of the Bible. And so ultimately, you have to call that person to faith and repentance in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is the internal witness of the Holy Spirit that uses these external and internal evidences to confirm the truth of the Bible upon their hearts. So yes, use evidences, but also understand it's the Holy Spirit that changes lives and opens up their eyes to the Bible. And so I think uh, I would ask questions, but then rely on the Spirit. Mm. You know, I think one of the things where you think about this, whether it's the Quran or just other religious texts, is just the difference between the Bible and these other religious texts. And uh, I remember hearing Al Mohler say this. One of the reasons that why he believes in the resurrection is because of the inclusion of the foot race to get to the empty tomb. <laughs> and you think about this, why are we informed that one disciple was faster than the other? The, the, it's in the ordinary of Scripture that actually, I think, shows its extraordinariness. The Scripture is not, you know, this isn't some decoder, some language that you need a decoder ring and secret tablets to be able to figure out. This is, there's even some just not the best of grammar among some of the New Testament authors, right? This is plain language in space and time, God revealing himself, and even informing us about disciples running to the tomb, mm. and that one is slower. And that's, it, this is so unlike the Quran, the Book of Mormon, and these other religious texts. The, the earthiness, the space and time ordinariness in which God has revealed himself in Scripture. There's been actually some wonderful uh, research in New Testament studies recently that has looked at some of those kind of occasional, seemingly random episodes in the New Testament. And scholars start to ask, why are they there? And the reason why they're there is in the first century, there was an assumption that contemporary eyewitnesses were essential for writing biography and history. And so those little episodes of somebody you know, running to the cross is actually a way of saying, you know, we know this really happened and we verified it through these eyewitnesses. <laughs> and these eyewitnesses validate what actually happened. So there's some really interesting scholarship that's going on right now that actually are looking into those little episodes in the Gospels. Yeah, that's great. All right, switching gears a little bit. How can we build relationships with non-Christians without compromising the truth? or offending them. Yeah, I think at one level we have to accept the reality that we are telling people that they are so bad that only the death of the Son of God on the cross can save them. No matter how much we try to couch the language on that, it is going to be offensive at some level. But I think the question gets at the heart of what we try to do in terms of our method and we want to let that be offensive and not us and how we present that. 
Yeah. And one of the best things I've ever heard is an elder I had the privilege of serving in the church with. We were at a dinner party together, and we got done, and we got in the car, and we had ridden together in there. And he said, did you guys have a guy never asked any questions? I'm not a guy I've ever with. He was, I was saying this in the seminar, like, have ever seen Brian reading the meat monster? You know? That's who we were with. We were there with the meat monster. The guy who was all about himself. And so here's the thing. When we were talking to people, if you look at it as an apologetic project instead of an image bearer of God, you're going to try to like bludgeon them with the truth. Uh, and so I would say let's treat people like people and actually want to get to know them, irrespective of if they come to share our beliefs or not, which we pray they will. And let's ask a lot of questions um, and be willing to listen to what they're saying and really take time to understand somebody. Uh, and I think that's one of the best ways to show that we love someone is that we care enough to get to know them. And not just because we want to notch in our evangelistic belts of going, look how many people have won to Jesus. Well, we all know we haven't won anybody to Jesus. He's doing the winning and we're all losing. And so when we do this, I think having a humble attitude, asking questions, and then being willing to say, we're not going to budge an inch. And there's a way to do that with love. I'm learning how to do that. I can give you a lot of examples of what not to do in that way. I may or may not have broken up a dinner party once, being really, really aggressive in my answers. I don't know. Ask my wife. It happened. So that's the deal. We, we want to stay humble and firm, and only the Holy Spirit can make us that way. And that's what He's shown me. I need to be humble and firm, and I want to fall off the ditch on either side of those. It's hmm. great. Uh, how did you come to faith in Christ? I came to know Christ in many ways not through the employment of an evangelist or, or even a, a single sermon of a preacher, but I came to know Christ in the quietness of my own room. And I was a wee lad of five or six years of age, and I knew that I was a sinner in, in need of a Savior. And in many ways, I've never known a day when I haven't really claimed Christ as my own. I've had wonderful Christian parents and have grown up in a church, but have also understood I can't ride on the laurels of my parents or ride on their coattails into glory, but I had to make that my own. And that happened, thankfully, at a very, at a very young age. Beautiful. And that's what I pray for my kids every day. My teacher, what John just said. And for me, I uh, went to the University of South Carolina. Good game, Kyle. Right out of the road. There um, might be some Clemson fans um, sure in the room. Now, you know? um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but when I went to Carolina, I, I did an undergraduate degree in philosophy. I was raised in a nominal Christian home, but I stopped going to church when I didn't have to, and really got a lot of reasons not to believe. And God's wonderful providence when I graduated from USC. Um, I was just in a circumstance where I, I met somebody I've never met before. He heard me talking about wrestling through spiritual things. I kind of didn't know where I was going. I was going to go off to grad school. And he said, You need to read a book by this guy named R.C. Sproul. And he gave me a book by R.C. And this was in uh, 2002. And I started listening uh, in my old truck, driving around the up country of Greenville. Uh, South Carolina was listening to Renewing Your Mind at 9 a.m. on 6.60 a.m. I can remember it. And for the first time in my life, I heard a Christian defending his faith. Actually, the first series that was being aired was R.C. Sproul going through defending the faith. And listening to that and starting to read on Wingman's website, all those hits back then, that was me, like every hour I was logging on, like reading. And that's when the internet had just come out. Kids, okay, so, um, we were reading through all that. God humbled me. What did it for me was R.C.'s explanation of sin. And I finally had a name for what I knew I couldn't control. And that was how bad I was. And when that happened, it made the grace so sweet. And it has been sweet ever since. It has been hard. I have had my faith challenge. I'm not saying, like, I got saved, and then I wanted to sing for Billy Graham for the rest of my life, and everything has been awesome ever since. That's not what I'm saying, but what has been beautiful through the whole thing is that what I heard 17 years ago has proven itself true every day, even through some really hard times. And the grace of God, just going back to that thing about Islam, one thing we want to talk about as well that no other holy book has, 
is a savior who dies for really bad people like us. Well, I have to say two things listening to you. I didn't know that story. So he is not a plant. We did not plant him here to talk about R.C. Sproul. That's number one. But secondly, now I know why I like you even more because of that uh, story. So I'm more in John's camp. Uh, my dad is a pastor. So I, I, I mean, I think the moment before I was born, of course, I was in church. I think I was always in church, always surrounded by the gospel, always surrounded by God's word. Um, but it was when I was 10. And I a very similar experience to yours, John, just realizing that I just can't be... Uh, this isn't something you catch that's like contagious, like a disease you catch by being around. It needed to be personal for me to put my trust in Christ as my savior. And uh, that's when I was 10. So always thankful uh, to have parents who love me and, and expose me to the gospel. And I don't know if you notice this either, but we, we like to, to tease Dr. Tweedale a little bit. So let's analyze his last name a little bit. So Tweed, of course, this is very Scottish. And Dale is very Scottish. This is the, the valley of Tweed. You are very Scottish. And you say, we lad. So you are so Scottish. So don't we love our Scottish dean, Dr. Tweed Dale? Uh, yes. Ooh, it's German for Scottish. Oh. <laughs> and I don't even know what Nichols is, so we'll just move on. Uh, we got two that are related, and one I did not transfer onto 3x5 card because I just love this little heart-shaped notebook paper. So if you have heart, a little heart there at the bottom, if you've got your heart-shaped or heart notebook paper, this is your question. Everybody's now looking at their neighbor to see <laughs> if the notebook has... We're going to keep this one. We're going to frame it, take it back to the college with us. But this is a serious question. Uh, is it unjust for God to send some people to hell. And then, let me read this. I, I have friends who don't believe and claims God's justice is unjust because they don't believe in such a harsh punishment as eternal damnation in hell. How do I respond to this? Is it unjust for God to send people to hell and how do we do with friends who say, uh, this is not a just God, this is an unjust God who harshly punishes people by sending them to hell? It's not unjust, it is clear, categorically, no. But you can't say that harshly. Mm. Mm. You can't come at somebody with an inferiority complex as though you're somehow fundamentally better than they are. Mm. Dear friends, it's with, with a great burden you have to realize people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ go to hell and that's exactly where they belong. Mm. And you have to say that with tears mm. because when you sin against an infinite God, you incur an infinite punishment. And so it is absolutely just for a holy God to condemn sinners to an eternal punishment. And so the first part of that is absolutely it is just and right for God to do so. But we say that with great tears and with a burden for those who do not know Christ. And then you ask the question, why? Well, in some ways, it's to display the full spectrum of the glory of God as he displays the holiness of his justice as well as the sweetness of his grace. His holiness and justice are displayed in condemning sinners to eternal punishment. But the sweetness of his grace is displayed in extending eternal life to all who trust in Christ. And those two things, justice and mercy, kiss and meet on the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he endured the wrath of God for all who trust in him, and he gives eternal life to those who place their faith in him. And so we see the full spectrum of the glory of God in justice and grace when he sends people to hell.
And that, that's exactly right. And one thing I had just on a personal note, part of my story was when I was in high school, like everybody else in high school, was in uh, life and made a profession of faith and quickly walked away from it. And one of the things that caused me to walk away from that early profession was I couldn't believe that God would send anybody to hell. When I got converted, I remember sitting in my room and thinking, the question is not, why does God send other people to hell? But given what I've done over the past years to that point, why didn't he send me to hell yesterday? We need to personalize that. It's very easy to make it abstract. Why does he send other people to hell? What I think we want to ask is, if we're not a Christian, why hasn't he sent me there yet? Why has he allowed me to have another day? And as Dr. Tweedell explained, we live in a time where God is either love or justice, but He can't be both. And the Bible gives us both. And the way you see that is the cross. As He said, it's where love and justice kiss. And if you want an answer to why there's no good reason to go to hell, look at the cross. <laughs> there's no good reason for anybody here to go to hell. We just look to him, and that is where these questions come together. Because if we're as bad as the gospel says we are, the cross is as good as it says it is. And we have a God who takes evil and suffering so personally, he comes in and deals with it personally so that we don't have to go to hell. So I think we want to personalize it and then bring it home to the full spectrum, as Dr. Trudeau mentioned, gospel attributes of God. I deeply appreciate uh, the answers here. These are, these are very, I hope you're catching this. These are very pastoral. I just simply add this. You're not doing anybody a favor by downplaying God's wrath and holiness and justice. So there's nothing kind or, or loving to not explain what are the, indeed the consequences of sin for someone. We have to do it in a loving way. We have to do it in a gracious way. The gospel is offensive. doesn't mean we are. Mm -hmm. But you're not doing anybody a favor by burying the reality of the wrath of God over sinners. Mm -hmm. And I, I think about this too. Uh, I won't get it exactly right, but one of my favorite lines of a hymn is from an Isaac Watts hymn. How sweet and awesome is this place. And Watts is, is sort of using the church service to be thinking about eternity and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I think it's stanza two, somewhere around there, where he speaks of how we are joined to gather in the feast. And he takes a step back and he says, Lord, why was I a guest? Um, that realization of just how merciful God is and bringing us how utterly undeserving we are of the mercy and grace of God. Mm. Uh, and so we're not doing ourselves a favor by downplaying the holiness and justice of God and what we deserved as sinners. Mm. Uh, we're certainly not doing our non-Christian friends a favor, but we're not doing ourselves a favor uh, by trying to have a kinder and gentler God. Mm. How do we respond to non-Christians who say the Bible promotes religious intolerance? But let me add a, a second question. It's worded very similar. So how do we respond to non-Christians who say the Bible promotes religious intolerance? And then this one, Christians sometimes have the reputation of being mean-spirited. How do I avoid that while still caring about the truth and talking about truth with my friends? So. Some are saying the, the Bible promotes intolerance. How do we talk about the Bible? And how do we engage people when there are examples of Christians who've been mean-spirited? I think we want to recognize at the outset that we're all intolerant of something. You know, if I come up to you and say, Hitler was awesome, <laughs> you're going to be intolerant of me, and you should be. You know, you're going to say, no, I don't think that's the case. And all of us have things in our lives that we are being tolerant of. And so what this question highlights is, where's the consistency of what we are intolerant of? And the, the Bible is not an intolerant book in the sense that it says that I'm right, you're wrong, shut up. The Bible is intolerant of falsehood because falsehood sends people to hell. And God loves us and doesn't want that. 
And so when we talk about intolerance in the scriptures, it's a different kind than I think what most people have in mind today. And what we have in mind today is kind of a personally intolerant, bigoted individual. Well, here's the good news about the gospel. Um, it's available to anybody. It's exclusive in that sense. Anybody can come. It does not matter your background. It does not matter what you've done. It does not matter where you are. You come as you are. But the best part of that is God never leaves you where you are. He changes you. And in that sense, it's very inclusive. Uh, it's exclusive in the sense, inclusive that anybody can come, exclusive in the sense that it's only through Jesus. And the way we communicate that is not by, again, looking at everybody else and saying, I'm awesome, you're not. The gospel forbids that. We're not. We're so bad, it took the death of the Son of God to save us. So we know we're bad. So we don't ever have to be intolerant in that sense, but we have to be intolerant of what God says to be intolerant of. And to express that in gentleness of love and in humility. But again, we're all intolerant of some things, and the minute that we start expressing what God says about something, it is going to be unpopular. Well, we've come to our <clears throat> last question. I think it would be helpful to... But all of us chime in here. So just be thinking about this. Uh, and again, this is a question that we've got two versions of, so I'll read both. Uh, why should someone even bother to pursue Christianity? And then a related question to that. Most young people do not care about church or deep spiritual matters. So how do we even start conversations with them about the things of God? This, we're talking about apathy. We're talking about folks who are just apathetic about these matters, how do we start a conversation? How do we show them that they need to be thinking about these matters? So. Okay. I think in many ways we need to lead with what we are for and not only focus on what we are against. So we want people to enjoy and know the beauty of the gospel. The psalmist will often talk about worshiping God in the splendor of holiness. Dr. Nichols was reading from 1 Peter 3 earlier today, and later in that chapter, Peter says that Christ died, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring us to God. So the glory of the gospel is that sinners, undeserving sinners, as we've already been talking about, can enjoy eternal life with the glorious, majestic, beautiful God of heaven and earth. And so we need to paint pictures verbally and with our lives of the beauty of the gospel. You understand, in Christ there is life, and apart from Christ there is death. If you put your hope in external things, right, whatever they be, career, music, art, family, anything, in external things, when those things go away, where is your joy? Where is your hope? Where is your life? But if your joy is in Christ, no matter what happens in life, and these things will go away, right? These things will go away at some time. You still have joy. So when you serve an infinite God, you have eternity to enjoy Him. And so the Christian life is summed up in this great theme of glorifying and enjoying God forever. And we need to encourage people to come and bow their knee and worship Him for all eternity. I got to answer in two ways. First, why should you pursue Christianity? Because you're, if you're not a Christian here, because if you're here and you made it through the doorway there, you're already living as if Christianity is true. Even to make sense of the world around us, you have to assume Christianity is true. So you're already living that way. Why not repent and believe in the one who loves you and has sent his son to be an offering for sinners to bring them to himself? Number one, you're already living that way. Number two, because you want to be happy. As Blaise Pascal, a French mathematician, put it, everyone wants to be happy, even a man who hangs himself. We're all looking for happiness. 
We're all looking for joy. We're looking for something that goes beyond what a illicit sexual encounter may do, may have drugs do, what alcohol can do, what art can do, what career, what everything about the Trudeau just mentioned. Everybody wants to know that, that a good day off never ends. Everybody wants to extend their happiness, and the only way that happens is if everything that God says is true about Jesus and about his word, and it is. I was thinking of Romans 1 when I was thinking about this question. And Romans 1 presents the idea not necessarily of a binary, no God, not, don't know God. The reality is everybody knows God because it's plain to them. But the issue is that knowledge has been futilely, but nevertheless, attempted to be suppressed. And if you follow the logic of Romans 1, you find people at different levels of suppression. And as they suppress the truth, God gives them over, they suppress the truth more. And the idea is not that people are static, or, but it's almost like a, a, a downward spiral. And I think this can happen culturally and individually. You can find cultures that have suppressed the truth more than other cultures. And you can find people who suppress the truth more than other. And there's different ways to do this. There's philosophical objections, et cetera, et cetera. But here, I think, is something we're very susceptible to in our moment, you're susceptible to. It is apathy. Mm -hmm. It is distraction. Your colleagues and peers are hardly ever apart from a screen looking at them. I mean, think about it. You are just constantly bombarded with images and sounds and things. You are constantly distracted. And in all of that distraction, sometimes the big questions can be put off. They can be ignored. Because you're just being entertained. It was, it was a book title from the 80s, Amusing Ourselves to Death. Listen, it was true of the 80s. How much more true is it now? We are amusing ourselves to death. I see it. I fly a lot. I see it every time I get on an airplane. Screens, instantly, everybody, screens, distract me. I can't even sit for 10 minutes without thinking I need a distraction, say. So here's what we, we need to reach out and love to these folks. And we need to prod and poke a little bit and bring this truth that they're trying to suppress up to the surface, right? And sometimes it happens, you know, uh, their parents diagnosed with cancer. And now all of a sudden, the world is broken in and they're suffering and they need answers and they look to you. God can break into their lives in all kinds of ways. And I think we need to be sensitive to that. And sometimes we need to poke a little bit. I liken it, you know the beach ball that you try to stand on, have you ever tried, in the pool, you know? And you sit on it, and then you try to stand on it and you try to hold it under and then your balance shifts and up pops the beach ball. That's sort of what people are doing with God. They're trying to suppress him like a beach ball and keep him under the water, but God pops up, right? And maybe as an apologist, you can go over and just push him off balance a little bit so that God pops up. But apathy and distraction may very well be a, a, a huge barrier to people just thinking about the things of God. And we need to be aware of that sensitive poke and prod so that they are thinking about these questions that ultimately matter uh, for them. Well, you've been a gracious audience, and can you join me in thanking our panelists for this session?